Let's chat. What are we chatting about today? Hassan Yards. Before coming to New York's Midtown for sightseeing, you might have just visited Times Square and Fifth Avenue, and that would be about it. Usually, you wouldn't specifically go to Hudson Yards because, in the past, this area was a very industrial place. Now, this area has become a must-visit for tourists if they come to Midtown for sightseeing. They will definitely make a special trip here to Hudson Yards to have a quick look around. As soon as you come out of the subway station at Hudson Yards, you're immediately surrounded by many skyscrapers that have only been completed in the recent years. And these skyscrapers are at least 50 stories tall, so it feels a bit like an arena for famous architects. As you come up from the subway escalators to the ground, you will see Norman Foster's designed office building called 50 Hudson Yards. On the left-hand side is an office building designed by Bjarke Ingwals called The Spiral. The Spiral actually looks like a ribbon of sky gardens wrapping around the entire building. If you continue walking south, you will see a photo spot right in the middle of the plaza called Vessel, designed by British designer Thomas Heatherwick. Its shape is somewhat like a hollow mesh shopping bag. However, the vessel, since its opening, has experienced several suicides, so it is currently closed to the public. Surrounding the vessel on the east are a pair of towers, one taller and one shorter. 30 Hudson Yards and 10 Hudson Yards, designed by KPF, mainly office buildings. The podium, nestled between the twin towers, is a shopping mall about seven stories tall. Regarding the south side of the plaza, there's an art centre about five storeys tall, called The Shed, designed by Dilla Scofidio Plus Renfro, often abbreviated as DSR. This project is also the only one in this development on land owned by the New York City government. It features a huge movable roof that can move to increase indoor exhibition space as needed. At the southwest corner of the square and connected in design to the art centre is a high-rise residential building, 15 Hudson Yards, also designed by DSR. At the southernmost end of this development, it connects to one of New York's most famous developments, Highline. But let's digress here and dedicate a separate episode to talk about Highline. Lastly, at the northwest corner of the plaza is a high-rise hotel and residential building, 35 Hudson Yards, designed by SOM. And to its north is a black office building, 55 Hudson Yards, designed by KPF. These are the sites you will see today at Hudson Yards. But this is just a small piece of the puzzle in this area's urban development. This episode is meant to discuss Hudson Yards in a more complete manner. Midtown versus Downtown. New York's urban development originally started from Lower Manhattan, considered the earliest city center. So now you will see a high density of buildings in Lower Manhattan with very many high-rise office buildings. As the city developed, Midtown Manhattan gradually developed into another city centre. So now New York's two main business centres. One is downtown, the other is Midtown. Hudson Yards we're talking about today is located within the broader Midtown area. Hudson Yards as a neighbourhood. Before discussing the urban development of the Hudson Yards area, I think we need to first clarify the terminology. The reason it's called Hudson Yards is because of this neighborhood's western side is adjacent to the Hudson River. In the early days, this area was an industrial zone. And it was this industrial zone that had a very close relationship with the development of New York's railway transportation system. I think this is also something that can be specially discussed in a future episode, specifically about the relationship between the railway and the development of New York City. So, for this reason, this neighborhood has a lot of land. Apart from the railways passing through, there were also a lot of rail yards, used for parking and maintenance of railway carriages. The largest of these rail yards was later leased to a private developer, which is, is the Hudson Yards development project we are starting with. This largest piece of rail yard was divided into two large plots, Eastern Yard and Western Yard. Both plots are quite large. The plot on the east side is where those skyscrapers mentioned at the beginning are located, which is the first phase of the Hudson Yards development. That part is considered to be fully completed. As for the west side, that is the second phase, which is still in the planning stages. So if you pass by the plot on the west side today, you can still see the rail yards. It looks like there are a lot of tracks and carriages lined up next to each other, kind of like a parking lot for train carriages. 
This entire Hudson Yards includes many other important facilities. Starting from the north, there's the Port Authority Bus Terminal. If you're taking a bus to other major cities on the East Coast in the US today, like Philadelphia or Washington DC, most of them depart from here. Now this terminal is actually very dilapidated, but the news has mentioned that Norman Foster has actually participated in the early planning and design of this terminal's renovation. So the terminal is planned to be renovated, it's just a matter of when. Walking west from this terminal is the Lincoln Tunnel, which actually goes under the Hudson River and connects to New Jersey on the west side. It's a very important underwater tunnel for cars and buses entering and exiting Manhattan. Additionally, on the northwest side of this neighborhood along the Hudson River, there's actually a very large convention center, specifically used for large exhibitions. The setting up of convention centers in the US and their locations actually have a significant relationship with urban development. That city might become famous because of that exhibition, or it has a convention center in a good location. Exhibitions are very good at bringing in crowds, stimulating the development of nearby hotels and stores, similar to the idea of building stadiums. Former US President Trump also once made a bid to buy this land for a convention center, but was later rejected. The state government then built this convention center on the same land themselves. On the south side of this neighborhood, from the Hudson shoreline, walking east, you will first pass the second phase of Hudson Yards, then the first phase, and continue east, you will come across a development called Manhattan West. Manhattan West, its scale, and the first phase of Hudson Yards are actually similar. This development is planned and designed by SOM, and developed jointly by the large US developer Brookfield and the Investment Authority of Qatar. Passing from the shoreline through these three huge urban blocks all follow a similar development model. They involve building a super large platform over still used rail yards and then constructing buildings on top of this platform. And these rail yards at the time of planning had anticipated future construction above them. So in arranging all the tracks, there was actually some space reserved between tracks for future construction of columns to support the platform and the buildings above it. Continuing east past the Manhattan West development, you will pass Moynihan Train Hall. Continuing further east will lead you to Penn Station and Madison Square Garden. It is neither a square nor a garden, it's a sports arena. So the blocks just mentioned all fall within the neighborhood of Hudson Yards. But Penn Station and the nearby blocks mentioned could be discussed in another episode about the surrounding developments. Lastly, within this neighborhood, it's worth mentioning that besides the Lincoln Tunnel mentioned earlier on the north, which is a main road or tunnel for cars and buses entering and exiting Midtown Manhattan, there's another tunnel under the Hudson River called the North River Tunnel, which all the railways use to pass underneath Hudson Yards, traveling east past Manhattan West development, and eventually connecting to Penn Station. The North River Tunnel has only two tracks, a two-track tunnel built about 100 years ago, so it's long been inadequate, especially after the devastation of Hurricane Sandy in 2012. It's quite a dangerous tunnel, old and worn out. So there's now a new plan called the Hudson Tunnel Project, planning to dig a new two-track tunnel a bit south of the North River Tunnel, also eventually connecting to Penn Station. Once the new tunnel is operational, the old North River Tunnel will also be renovated. This project has already started in the latter half of this year, so upon completion, there will be four modern tracks under the Hudson River, and it will be feasible for high-speed rail to use them as well. Rezoning. Having briefly introduced Hudson Yards, let's talk about why, after discussing the current state of this neighborhood, so many new buildings have been built here over the past few years, and why there are so many development projects planned for the next few decades that will gradually come to fruition. With the development and expansion of Midtown Manhattan, and in order to compete with other international cities like London and Hong Kong's international business centers, New York actually needs more and better commercial office spaces to attract businesses and talents. So actually since the 1950s, there have been ongoing discussions and proposals to develop the Hudson Yards because it is located within Midtown Manhattan. At the time, this area was essentially an industrial zone with a bunch of railway yards, but if you wanted to redevelop this area, it was relatively easy. Elsewhere, there might be a lot of private land or landlords to consolidate, but here it was relatively easier. 
In 2005, during the tenure of New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, in 2005, the urban redevelopment of the Hudson Yards was approved, replanning the original industrial land into mixed-use residential and commercial land. There was a subplot that the land for the second phase of Hudson Yards was actually reserved during the urban redevelopment for a stadium intended as the main venue for New York City's bid for the 2012 Summer Olympics. In the end, the 2012 Olympics were held in London, so the plan for a stadium on this plot was abandoned. In any case, the new urban plan passed in 2005 had already set the basic framework for future urban development in this area. City planning. General urban planning can be simply divided into several elements, with public infrastructure connecting various blocks, and each block can be developed by private individuals or by public sectors or developed cooperatively by corporate sectors. In the urban planning of this area, there are several important pieces of public infrastructure that were initially built by the government. The first, and basically the most important, is the extension of the Number 7 Line subway. At that time, to develop this area, the Number 7 Line subway was extended from its original terminal at Times Square westward to the center of the Hudson Yards. A north-south linear park was also built in the center of this neighborhood called Hudson Park and Boulevard. Future buildings would be built along the east and west sides of this park. The vessel, previously mentioned, is located at the southern end of this park. Other public facilities include the expansion of the Convention Center and the renovation of Moynihan Train Hall. Of course, the most important public facility is the large platform above the rail yards. Simply put, the government had to build the platform first before developers would be willing to develop here. Otherwise, if developers had to spend money to build this large platform, their costs would be very high. Initially, to construct these public infrastructures, the most important challenge, or the biggest problem, was where the government's money would come from. Just the extension project of the Number 7 Line subway required $2.4 billion so to solve this problem, the New York City government used a rather special financial plan, simply put, borrowing from the future. Assuming this area would attract many residential or commercial development projects in the next 30 years, the developers build these residences. Whether you are moving in or working here, residents will pay property taxes and workers will also pay income taxes. So compared to the past industrial land with yards and factories, the future government's tax revenue would greatly increase. But if the government doesn't build these infrastructures at the beginning, developers wouldn't want to come to such a barren place to build houses. So anticipating an increase in future tax revenue, the government issued government bonds at the beginning to raise funds for constructing these public facilities. It means borrowing money from those who buy the bonds. In the next 30 years, they'll repay those who bought the bonds with the increased tax revenue, of course, with some interest. Otherwise, no one would buy the bonds. In the next 30 years, repaying annually with the increased tax revenue to those bondholders. So through such financial planning, as mentioned in 2005, when the urban redevelopment was passed, in 2006, through this financial planning, they raised $3 billion to build those public infrastructures, among which the most important included the extension of the number seven line subway. Private development. The government did what it had to do. Actually, what remains is for the private development projects to enter the scene. The Hudson Yards project mentioned at the beginning should actually be considered one of the earliest development projects in this neighborhood. In 2010, a company called Related Companies and another called Oxford Properties. These two companies jointly acquired the development rights for two very large rail yards, which are the lands for Hudson Yards Phase 1 and Phase 2. For developers, to develop such a large piece of land, the biggest challenge is also a matter of money. Unless a developer has $25 billion in their pocket to splurge. Otherwise, this money also has to be borrowed. The developer's financial plan, besides the typical loan from financial institutions for development, this project also attracted some quite special investors, like a British children's investment fund and an Israeli bonds. Even Mitsui Fudosan from Japan invested a lot of money. Among the most noteworthy is probably the EB-5, the US Investment Immigration Program. Simply put, a foreigner, by investing $1 million in a specific investment area in the US and creating 10 jobs, can obtain a green card. This development actually raised quite a bit of money through this program, especially from Chinese investors. 
However, this investment immigration program itself is very controversial and has already been amended two years ago to increase the investment threshold from $1 million to $1.8 million. Recently, the chairman of Shanghai's largest overseas immigration and investment agency was arrested by Shanghai police in August this year. So this type of investment immigration program actually has a lot of complexities behind it. We will not delve into too much detail. Returning to the development itself, phase one is basically completed now, including those buildings we mentioned at the beginning. Most are new office buildings, some high-end residences for sale and a shopping mall. For developers, these are relatively high return on investment buildings, all aimed at higher income users. Usually to balance development, the government will use some incentive measures like tax reductions or even direct requirements that the development must include some non-profit oriented types of buildings. So the preliminary planning of Hudson Yards phase two includes a fairly high proportion of social housing and a school. However, what exactly will be built in phase two is not very clear yet. The latest development is that the developer plans to vie for one of the three casino operating licenses that the New York state government is preparing to issue. At present, compared to other competitors' proposals, Hudson Yards actually has a good chance of winning. So, in addition to the various types of residences and a school that are sure to be part of Phase 2, there might also be a casino. The current status of Hudson Yards is that Phase 1 has been completed. Phase 1, as mentioned, mostly consists of projects that are more profitable for developers. So actually, some people feel that these houses are built for the wealthy. Thus, there are some negative evaluations. But since it has only completed phase one, the whole development project is not yet fully completed. So actually, if the entire development project reaches a more mature stage, I still think Hudson Yards will be a quite nice city center in the future. This neighborhood still has many development projects underway, but because of the pandemic and the impact of the global economy, since Hudson Yards phase two should have started construction this year, but was delayed by the pandemic, so it's still in the planning stages. Therefore, the development speed of this whole project, even the other development projects in the neighborhood, might be affected, influenced by the pandemic and the development of the global economy. Additionally, after the pandemic, the widespread adoption of remote work may change the city's demand for office spaces, or the types of office spaces it really needs might also be different from before. These changes will have an impact, but what will not be affected is the importance of the Hudson Yards. It's just a matter of how long it will take to achieve the vision anticipated at the time of the 2005 urban planning, 